Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Good lawful. I'll mate her. I'll mate her, also called the crying god or the broken god is the deity of martyrdom, endurance and suffering in the Forgotten Realms pantheon of gods. Islemater offers relief to those who are suffering by taking their pain onto himself, and forgiving those who trespass against him. Basically, he exists to die for your sins. History. Starting out as a relatively obscure deity, Islemater didn't have much going for him. In a world filled to the brim with gods vying for attention and taking all they can get, a deity specifically dedicated to giving and shouldering the burdens of others wasn't going to get very far. Then something happened that no one could have predicted, the Vikings invaded. Specifically, Ti from the Norse Pantheon came crashing through the planar barriers and decided to impose his version of goodness and law on Toral. Islemater saw a kindred spirit with the new god on the block and allied with Ti to catapult himself into celebrity status. Enjoying a massive boost in power and popularity. Torm would later join the alliance and create the triad, essentially a standing arrangement where their priesthoods overlap and assist one other. The triad did falter briefly when to killed Helm, causing Islemater to have his doubts and move his divine realm into Soon's region of Brightwater, but he later moved back and again when Tyr abdicated his power to Torm and retired from the realms. So the triad strictly no longer exists, although the close alliance between the remaining gods still stands. Islemater is perhaps dangerously misunderstood. Many believe that as the god of willing suffering he is a pushover, worthy only of pity. But he has a fantastic wrath when faced with atrocity, and he commands a particularly large and pious following, meaning that he has the divine power to back himself up if he needs to. Worshippers. The followers of Islemater, called Islemateri, form what one might consider to be an ideal charitable institution even in real life. Their duties are almost entirely humanitarian, they feed and shelter the homeless, perform burials, respond to crises, treat the diseased and heal the wounded, all without expecting payment in return. They fund themselves based almost entirely on donations. There is no centrally commanding body of the church, although monasteries of monks usually tie themselves to specific temples of clerics, forming an informal hierarchy at the local level. Despite being a mostly peaceful and compassionate religion, Islemater sponsors loads of orders of paladins, including the Companions of the Noble Heart whose duty is to seek out those who enjoy bringing suffering to others, and the Order of the Golden Cup who are more like traveling healers who take up quests to protect the innocent. Other orders include the Holy Warriors of Suffering, and the Order of the Lambent Rose. There are also many orders of monks such as the Disciples of Street Solas that twice martyred, the Disciples of Street. Morgan the Taciturn and the Sisters of Street Jasper of the Rocks. Islemater is a popular deity for those who oppose Kalemba over the whole stick the souls of atheists in a war to suffer for eternity thing. How Islemater himself views the matter is unknown though he approves enough that these rebels aren't considered false and can even get epic level spellcasting from him. Broken Ones. The Broken Ones are an order of monks that are slightly more militarized than the rest of Islemater's clergy. They dedicated to the protection of Islemater's temples, and also act as roving agents of justice against those who perform acts of cruelty. Mechanically this translates as monks who can perform lay on hands like a paladin and have the tracking abilities like a ranger. Triadic Knights are an order of knights, most often paladins, but not necessarily, who revere the triad as a whole, and believe that to truly embody the virtues of paladinhood they must draw on the strengths of all three gods. Represented uniquely as a 7 level prestige class that gains abilities relevant to each individual faith, including the hands of Islemater meaning they can no longer be sickened, the eyes of T where they can no longer be blinded or dazzled, and the heart of Torm becoming immune to fear. As well as continuing to gain improve the Paladin Mount, Spellcasting, and Smite Evil abilities. Cult of Shared Suffering. A heretical sect of the Church of Islemater, they believe that everyone must take a part of the crying god's burden. 
To accomplish this, they conducted kidnappings, incited riots, indulged in self-flagellation, and just generally went around spreading suffering. The clerics of the heresy have access to healing, retribution, strength, and suffering domains, and had to be true neutral. Of course the church believes that it isn't Ilmata giving them their spells, but some other god, with the likely suspects being Cyric, Laviata, and Beshaba. Trivia. Spelling is important, because in 2e Planescape there is another separate deity called Ilmata, who is the Finnish god of mothers who travels the material plane, alleviating the pains of childbirth. In real life Finnish, Ilmata translates literally as female air spirit. Where she was a virgin entity who got impregnated by the seas and gave birth to Voinormidon, the demigod hero of Finnish folklore. Nabanian. Nabanian is the Lion King of good animals and beasts. He is both powerful and gentle and leads his pride directly, teaching them to choose paths that are both good and lawful. History. Nabanian is an interloper deity to Pharaon, though not much is known about his origin world other than ancient texts referring to him as Aslan, which potentially makes him the primary god of Narnia, and therefore also Jesus. Though since Aslan is a Turkic word for lion it may mean absolutely nothing at all. Nabanian entered Pharaon in the Weathercote Wood from one of the magical pools that led to other prime material worlds and wandered Toral for about a century before making his realm in the Gulfmere Forest with a pack of Lamassu. Possibly giving rise to the in-universe theory that he is the father of all Lamassu in the realms. In early 2e days, he was pretty cozy with Lurut to the point that both religions were practically inseparable and were referred to under the catch-all terminology of beast cult though they remain distinct from other beast cults such as those of the Uthgar tribe since they were both deities in their own right, rather than being powerful spirits. He was also friendly with Sharis, as they are both feline deities, though he frequently gets annoyed at Sharis lack of focus and would probably prefer her older incarnation of Bast. During the time of troubles, he got into a fight with Mailer and drove him away, expanding Nabanian's power base into the nearby areas, converting tribes of Wemix to his religion and bringing them into his collective great pride. The Wemix considered Nabanian a warrior deity, although he tried to impress values of goodness and compassion on them. From here, worship of Nabanian spread even further. During the 4e spell plague he was infected by blue fire and transformed into a dark lion with a burning blue mane under the control of his great enemy Mela. Though thankfully he was healed by the Chosen of Lathander and continues to wander the realms, though under the diminished status as an exarch of Sylvanus. Worshippers. Nabanian is primarily venerated by intelligent animals and beast-like creatures though he does attract humanoid followers, typically humans or wild elves who see him as a patron of monarchs and law keepers. His priests are referred to as firemains. Deep in the Gulfmere forest there is a human village called Gunth whose inhabitants live the life of cats. There is also Nathlek, the city of cats which is populated by were animals of various feline breeds who worship Nabanian alongside Sheris. Dogma. Hunt only when hungry and do not gorge without need. Waste nothing and all shall have plenty. The cycle of life links all living things into one being, and that being is life itself. The law of the jungle is that only the strong survive, but they survive best by being leaders, not tyrants, by protecting the weak, not bullying them. All creatures have their strengths in the assigned roles and should be encouraged to find their niche. From cooperation between beings of differing strengths comes the strength of teamwork and community, the strongest force of all. By demonstrating compassion and tolerance and living within the land, all living creatures may find harmony with nature and one another. By staying true to oneself and one's pride and conducting oneself with dignity and honor, the respect of one's peers may be earned. Realms. Nabanian's realm of the Pride Lands is largely the same no matter what edition it is set in. It consists of a huge sunlit savanna-like plain that is interspersed with trees. In the Great Wheel cosmology, the plane is mildly good aligned thanks to its position in the outer planes. Though this trait is absent from other cosmologies, Nabanian presumably has the ability to make his own divine realm good. Alternately in the World Tree cosmology, druid spells that are cast here are automatically enlarged and extended without any extra effort on the part of the caster. Either way, 
petition as that begin their afterlives here steadily take on more and more animal trays, presumably cats, until they truly become celestial animals. Wemics are an exception and are allowed to retain their original forms in their afterlife. Torm. Torm is the Forgotten Realm's god of duty, loyalty, courage, obedience, and self-sacrifice. He used to be a far smaller player, but he was one of only two gods in the FR that didn't royally piss off AO during the time of troubles beside Helm, so he got a promotion when he got back. He's the sort of default patron of paladins in 5e. His two bros are Tyr and Almater, who collectively form a divine power block called the Triad. Dogma. Salvation may be found through a service. Every failure of duty diminishes Torm and every success adds to his luster. Strive to maintain law and order. Obey your masters with alert judgment and anticipation. Stand ever alert against corruption. Strike quickly and forcefully against rotten hearts of mortals. Bring painful, quick death to traitors. Question unjust laws by suggesting improvement or alternatives, not additional laws. Your fourfold duties are to faith family, masters, and all good beings of Faerun. Tip. Tip, also known as the maimed god, but nothing to do with the other maimed god, is with the deity of justice and law in the Forgotten Realms setting, as well as being a member of the three Asgardian pantheon in exactly the same capacity. Is also virtually identical to the real world Norse Germanic god Tip, or Tiwaz. Asgardian. Tyr is the son of Odin and Frigga and is considered the third most senior deity after Odin and Thor and was the patron of trust, courage and sure tactics and can predict the course of any battle. He lost his hand when the gods attempted to bind Fenrir and was fated to die at Ragnarok. This being mythology, it's complicated as shit, of course. According to other versions of the myth, Tyr is actually a Jotun, not an Aesir, and he's the child of Heim. Forgotten Realms. He came to Toril as an interloper deity during a period known as the Procession of Justice, where he burst into the realms without warning at the head of an army of 200 archons and attempted to pacify the region of Jarmdath which had fallen to lawlessness. This campaign brought Islemater on board, who had previously been somewhat of an unknown deity and catapulted him into popularity, and later Torm would join as Tiswalader. Till had only planned to stick around in the realms long enough to finish his campaign of bringing law and order and intended to return home afterwards, but by the time he was finished most of his army was dead and his cult had started to spread across the continent, so the triad was born. The reason he is referred to as the maimed god is because he has lost his hand and has been struck blind. Similarly to the Asgardian telling, he lost his hand to a hound, in this case Kezif the Chaos Hound and follows roughly the same story where Gond created an unbreakable leash and bet the hound that he could not break out of it. Kezif agreed to the bet on condition that Tip, the least duplicitous of the gods, placed his hand in the beast's mouth. Gond then anchored the chain to Pandemonium and Mistra laid a magical veil over the beast that automatically repaired itself. When Kezif finally understood what the gods were doing to him he bit his hand off in anger. He was later struck blind during the time of troubles after talking back to Ao about the injustice of punishing all of the gods for the actions of an unknown perpetrator. Ti started going off the rails not long after that and killed Helm when he started getting suspicious that the god of vigilance was attempting to steal the heart of Timora, who Ti was attempting to woo. Quite possibly because of this, he lost his faith in his ability to lead properly and abdicated his god who to Torm allowed much of his portfolio to be absorbed by Bahamut and then quietly retired back to the upper plains where he was later killed in a demonic invasion, probably returning home to die at Ragnarok. Then he came back for the 5th edition Redkins, taking most of his power and portfolio back from Bahamut. Worshippers. Tiff it's the image of a traditional god of law and goodness, so his faith particularly appeals to those with a sense for fairness and ordered civilization. They largely subscribe to the eye for an eye philosophy which gives them a reputation for being harsh arbiters of the law, but they frequently err on the side of mercy, particularly when crimes have been committed through ignorance or by mistake. Though individual churches keep an ongoing book of law giving that they share with nearby temples to ensure up to date criminal records are held, and to make certain that repeat criminals are identified and dealt with appropriately. He has a lot of paladins and clerics who fight against tyranny in lawless lands and will often act as judge, 
jury and executioner in many cases. They will never enforce laws which can be shown to be unjust, though the measure of unjust can be broad and can often force them to abide by laws which are merely unfair. Though to their credit followers of T will attempt to change such laws by working within the system. Specific orders of Tyran Paladins include the Knights of Holy Judgment who focus primarily eliminating perversions of law, such as exterminating devils and punishing criminals. While the Knights of the Merciful Sword spend their time upholding Tyr's view of goodness and seek out and slay monsters, particularly demons, while protecting the common man. Triadic Knights are an order of knights, most often paladins, but not necessarily, who revere the triad as a whole, and believe that to truly embody the virtues of paladinhood they must draw on the strengths of all three gods. Represented uniquely as a 7 level prestige class that gains abilities relevant to each individual faith, including the hands of Islemata meaning they can no longer be sickened, the eyes of T where they can no longer be blinded or dazzled, and the heart of Torm becoming immune to fear. As well as continuing to gain improve the paladin mount, spellcasting, and smite evil abilities. Realm. T resides in the court where no lie can be spoken and attempts at deception automatically fail. The exact position of the court varies between editions, though both are relative to the mountain of Celestia. In the Great Wheel it exists in Lunia, the first layer of the Great Mountain, while in the World Tree model it exists as a separate mountain in view of Celestia itself. Siamorph has her realm close by, but they are not considered allied powers. Petitioners to his realm arrive as Lantern Archons, but have no planar commitment and can leave and return at will. Though the House of the Triad as an entire plane has different rules on petitioners depending on the deity, so those visitor from Helm's realm for instance retain their mortal forms. Trivia. Like several other D&D deities, Tyr is borrowed from real world mythology, specifically Norse. Though in Tyr's case his origins are practically unchanged from the source material, Unlike Oma or Sylvanus who have been significantly altered in some way after the transition. The primary difference is that Norse Tyr might have actually been the head of his pantheon, even over Odin. At some point, note that the Norse word Tyr translates simply as God. This element sometimes appears in the various bynames of other deities, for example, Gortratyr, which is one of Odin's names. Similarly his mythological father may have been Odin, or alternatively it could have been the giant Himit. Norse history can be somewhat hazy like this. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Good neutral. Chauntia. Chauntia is the daughter of the opposing forces of light and dark, Selun and Shar and is one of the oldest deities in the entire Forgotten Realms pantheon of gods. As the goddess of life, she is the embodiment of the entire world. Patron of everything that is cultivated, and sometimes attributed to be the mother of all the mortal races. History. When Ao came into the empty cosmos, his only real contribution was to create light, Selun, and dark, Sha, then sit back and watch everything else coalesce. Between the two sister deities their first act was to create a canvas to paint on, so they created Chauntia who was the manifestation of the world of a bit oral. When Chauntia complained about being cold and lonely, Selun created the sun, a mornator, to warm her up. Shah objected very strongly and kicked off the battle of the gods that followed and continues to this day. Chauntia is technically sister to all of the elder gods that arose out of this struggle, but it is doubtful that she considered many of them as such, with the possible exception of Mistril who was the last god to appear. Indeed Chauntia and Mistra are occasionally worshipped side by side in some regions of the realms. Despite everything largely being kicked off by the creation of the sun, 
Chauntia has very little connection with his first incarnation of Amornator, but later she has had an off again on again relationship with his successor Lathander. Though Lathander has had his own dalliances with other deities, often initiating their own conflicts, the two are inseparably linked, quite possibly because they are both the primary deities of the common folk. Chauntia used to be the goddess of all things natural, but lost part of that portfolio when interloper gods from other pantheons infiltrated the realms. Sylvanus entered from the Celtic pantheon and gradually took oversight over wild nature, but this served to focus Chauntia towards agriculture and gardening and presumably made her more comprehensible and popular with the common folk. However, she is still revered as the patroness of wild nature in some parts of the realms under the aspect of Janeth, which was her old name in Netheral. She is also known under a number of names and guises elsewhere throughout history. In 4 it transpired that even Yondala, mother of halflings, was an aspect of Chauntia, which only serves to demonstrate how widespread and subtle her influence spreads. Despite her importance, Chauntia is more of a passive bystander rather than an active player in the battles of the gods. While she is friendly with the good gods, she has had little involvement with significant events. This might be due to her followers being mostly unobtrusive farmers and civilians, rather than epic adventurers. So she has a tremendous following, perhaps the largest in the entire realms, but also some of the least impacting. Worshippers. While the Church of Chauntier is decentralized and sectarian with druids and clerics tending to different duties with very little overlap, there is no grand leader who issues proclamations. The church outlines a broad set of practices and prohibitions, but encourages individualism, with the primary tenets being to prevent unnecessary destruction and to nurture growth. Their minimal hierarchy and willingness to assist during harvest time makes them immensely popular with the peasantry. Priests of Chauntia tend to be the primary minister to most rural villages. Despite being mostly considered quiet and unassuming, Chauntia does sponsor an order of paladins called the Field Guardians whose primary duty is the protection of the common folk, as a paladin should. Some of her clerics have also started banding together with clerics of Helm and Selun, and later adding faithful members of the churches of Lathander, Nabanian and soon to create the Fellowship of the Purple Staff, which is an alliance of churches dedicated to the protection of civilization and the expansion of villages. Deni. Deni is the seneschal of Omar, the god of knowledge. So where Omer gets all the glory as the god of invention, inspiration, instruction manuals and intellectual property laws, Denner is the one who does all the manual labor and actually writes that shit down. You might think him a minor minion of little note in a pantheon that spans over pretty much every variation of conceivable themes and has several deities with overlapping portfolios, Denner contributes very little to the evolution of the Forgotten Realms, except when he's placed under the care of R. A. Salvatore. Denner's two major contribution are, his chosen and his last stand to try and halt the onset of 4E. When Shah and Sirik colluded to kill Mistra and precipitated the events of the spell plague and essentially flipping the table of magical powers, Denner apparently disappeared as well, not answering prayers or granting spells. It was later discovered that he had not perished in the upheaval, but had set himself the task of attempting to rewrite the weave. Which was something only Mistra could have done, and was probably outside of Denner's ability, but he tried anyway. And for the years of the spell plague this underdog of a deity was trying to keep things from becoming any worse. Denner's final action was to write himself into the weave as a means of saving it, disappearing in the process, but allowing magic to function properly again. We could take that as the fluffy excuse for 4 in general and why spellcasting went all morg for no good reason, but we can't blame Denner for what our favorite game would become, since the decision was made at the corporate level and not by the authors. So Denner really was the failed hero of the setting, who gave his last gasp to keep it alive. Or was he? Then 5e e reconned it, so it never happened. Back to the writing desk with Denner. But we love him even more than before. Chosen. As mentioned, the other awesome thing about Denner is his chosen. Those disciples he grants a portion of his divine power too. To test if you are the chosen one is simple, Denner keeps a magical textbook in the mortal realms called the Tome of Universal Harmony. Unless they are the chosen one, 
Anyone who reads this book of pure divine mysteries ends up catatonic as their puny little mind breaks from the magnitude of knowledge thrown at them. Chosen on the other hand, interpret the information as a song of practically unlimited information that they can fast forward or rewind as necessary. Giving them the ability to recall divine magical spells without preparation. They also gain the ability to cast a number of useful spell-like abilities, increase turning undead ability, magically brand heretics, shape shift into a particular animal form relevant to the holder and are immune to practically every major debuff. Like any god, Den is chosen are absolutely Mary Sue's, though in this case the abilities granted are not entirely relevant to a god of writing. What does turning into a shark or a squirrel have to do with literature? Despite that, the current holder is Cadley Bonadus who ended up kicking out the stuffy old members of the church after a significant event involving vampires and then built a fabulous new cathedral single-handedly using his gifted magical powers. However he later gave his existence over to containing the magical essence of a supercharged Dracolich, consigning himself to an eternity of casting containment spells on the creature. Eldeth. Eldeth is the goddess of peace in the Forgotten Realms campaign setting. She is the patroness of druid groves and is said to exist wherever there is calm. History. Eldeth is often said to be the sister of Meliki, though the truth of this is not entirely clear. She does consider Sylvanus to be a father figure though Eldeth finds his robustness intimidating. As the deity of pacifism and peace she does not allow herself to take hostile actions against others, preferring to capitulate and retreat until her opponents work themselves onto untenable positions. This would make her the diametric opposite of Tempus, the god of war, but he generally ignores her, though he respects her position well enough that he has forbidden his faithful from harming hers on pain of denied resurrection in warrior's rest. However, Eldeth is so shy and passive that she is almost a forgotten power that may fade out of existence altogether. As if to prove the point, in 4e she gets no mention at all. Despite teetering on the edge of irrelevance, she must have a powerful benefactor somewhere. She used to be considered a neutral demigoddess who wandered the prime material plane, but about 11 years after the time of troubles she mustered the divine power to create a divine realm in Elysium, as well as elevating herself to true, albeit lesser, deity status. Scholars reckon that either Meliki, Mistra or Chauntia sponsored the move after Eldeth turned towards active goodness, probably to keep the more general ideals of peace from fading into insignificance. Worshippers. Priests of Eldeth. Called Eldeth in a few and far between, considering the realms are teeming with monsters, evil wizards, warring nations and evil deities, her ethos of pacifism is an unpopular cult. Her clerics druids monks tend to settle in quiet, out of heeway places and seek enlightenment, though a basic requirement of the faith is learning how to swim, since her portfolio covers pools and waterfalls. Eldith expects her followers to be as non-violent as possible, they are allowed to conduct themselves as they see fit, her dogma allows defense, but not punishment so her followers can kill, but only in direst need. She even has a group of adventurer priests called freewalkers who act as mediators and go-betweens for other faiths. It is considered a mark of skill amongst her clergy to be able to defeat an opponent using purely defensive means. Despite being an independent deity, her followers are inextricably linked to those of Meliki and Sylvanus. They are expected to coordinate with them and provide aid wherever possible. Enlil. Enlil is the head of the Sumerian and Untheric pantheons, and the god of air and war. In the Forgotten Realms. Enlil, like the other Untheric gods, came to Toral after Ao allowed them entry, whereupon his manifestation helped in freeing the Mjolni from slavery under the wizard kings of Amuska. In the final battle, Eran's minus 2488 DR, he, along with the other gods, turned the fertile lands of the Amaskari into the Roran Desert. Enlil then lead the Mjolni to the western coast of the Alamba Sea, where the nation of Untha was founded, and which he ruled for over a thousand years. In minus 1081 DR, the last remaining Amaskari wizard opened a portal to another world, and from there hordes of grey orcs came through to conquer the lands of Unther and Mulharand, leading to the manifestations of the gods fighting against the avatars of the orcish gods. Most of the Untheric gods died in these battles, and in minus 734 DR, 
Enlil left Toril, leaving his son Jiljim as the ruler of Unther. It wasn't until 1486 DR when Enlil returned to Toril, stopping Timonther's return to Abir and manifesting in the form of a dragonborn. He then declared the dragonborn of Timonther as his new people and chose Kapeshkmalek de Musi as his chosen. He eventually negotiated with Asmodeus to resurrect Nana Sin as an immortal in exchange for her divinity, which also brought back Azath. Appearance. Before he left, Enlil appeared as a tall man, with a dark and weighty beard and curly hair. He wore a war helm that was immune to any attack or harmful substance, and wielded an unbreakable stone axe that could disenchant any weapon it struck. After his return, he appeared as a black-scaled dragonborn with golden eyes, surrounded by a lightning storm. Gwaren Windstrom. This guy started out as a mortal who was really good at tracking and was so good that he even managed to track down and slay several manifestations of the beast god, Mela. So Miliki raised him up to a demigod. His problem is that his portfolio is so freaking specific and not that much different from Miliki's at all. He has no organized clergy away from the church of Miliki, they even share the same holy places and observances. So people who meet a cleric or druid of Gwerim Winstrom might not have actually realized that he was actually a god at all and merely some proxy or a herald. This means that he is in real danger of becoming forgotten about and just being absorbed into Miliki. This probably isn't a terrible fate for him, since at least he would be joining his own goddess rather than being reduced to nothingness by some enemy. Lathander. Lathander is was the main god of the sun in the Forgotten Realms campaign setting. While he is one of the most significant gods of the setting, his status is in a bit of uncertainty. He is probably the reborn aspect of a much older god of the sun, Amornator. See below, but unusually for divine aspects, the two deities have quite varied goals and portfolios. Lathander is probably also Pella from the core setting, though probably a younger, more handsome version of Pella. In Ravenloft, the deity called the Morning Lord as an offshoot of Lathander's worship, evolved into something very different from its progenitor. History. Lathander is the reincarnation or an aspect of the first sun god Amornator who was one of the elder gods created from the strife between Shah and Saloon. One event in which Lathander had a major part in, was the Dawn Cataclysm, a hazy entry in the history of the realms that very few people know anything about but was considered a catastrophe second only to the time of troubles. What is known for sure is that Lathander somehow got the idea that the gods of Pharaoh needed to be more like him and so he tried to alter the gods to his liking. The failed attempt directly resulted in the death of Murdane, goddess of pragmatism, and Helm's lover, which made Helm very angry at Lathander. Several other deities supposedly died during this event along with several powerful outsiders, and possibly heralded the end of myth drama in the mortal world, though few details are given. It is suspected that the Dawn Cataclysm coincided with number of other key events, such as the splitting of Titch, goddess of luck. Titch was an early interloper to Ferran from the Greek pantheon. In the realms she became a companion of Lathander and the two became lovers, though the whimsical Lady Luck eventually grew bored with him and left. She later found a rose that she thought Lathander had gifted to her as a romantic gesture and kept it, though it eventually turned out to have been a cursed trap lain by Monda, god of rot. The eventual corruption of the goddess of luck forced the other deities to slay her, after which he corpse split into the twin goddesses Timora and Besheba. Another conflict that was believed to have occurred during the dawn cataclysm were the battles between Azath and Savras, where Savras became imprisoned in a scepter for millennia and Azath was elevated to divine status. Of course it is difficult to say how much Lathander was to blame for the whole series of events. The rest of the pantheon were certainly wary of him and try to keep him from endangering the status quo. For his part, Lathander believes that Shah somehow had a part to play in the Dawn Cataclysm and seeks to try it all over again, but do it better the second time around. Lathander is close to the mother goddess Chauntia, where they have an on-off romantic relationship. Presumably breaking up whenever Lathander proposes something obviously stupid good. She, along with Omer and Lyra, knows of his attempts to replicate his previous experiment but are cautious enough to let him try because they know that evil needs to be conquered once and for all. Amornator. Amornator is the original god of the sun in the Forgotten Realms setting. 
He was quite widely worshipped, though was seen as quite a harsh deity, in contrast to the compassionate Lathander. Amornator's creed was a strict adherence to the law, to the point that he supposedly only claimed the portfolio of time due to a punctuation mistake which said that Amornator shall be responsible for all time. The misrepresentations of his followers. So yeah. He's a classic raw abuser to gain more power. However, faith in him practically came to a sudden end when the nation of Netherol collapsed along with the near entirety of his worshippers and so he died a slow death of neglect, like some forgotten pensioner in a care home. Amornator's corpse was said to become an astral shipping hazard and he was replaced by a new, younger and more vibrant sun god who was more popular with the kids. However, the story doesn't end there. Radical priests within Lathander's own church believed that Amornator never died at all, that he simply became a different god to adapt to a different climate. Though Amornator was officially declared dead and incapable of answering prayers or empowering diving magic, a few people still believed in him. Though they were considered harmless heretics by the mainstream church of the sun god. However, during the events of the spell plague Lathander went surprise and pulled off his rubber mask to reveal that he had been a Mornator all along, but rather than assume Lathander's portfolio wholly, Lathander seems to be permitted continued existence as an aspect separate from a Mornator and still answers prayers and provides spells under both guises. Worshippers. Lathander is pretty much the stereotypical good god of any particular setting. As the god of light, birth, growth, Healing in the sun he is worshipped by practically anyone with a sense of hope and plausibly has an organized religion which includes paladins, druids and wizards. In fact, you could steadily remove each of the goodly gods and Lathander could have a good reason for standing in. So he could very well stand alone as the only god in a monotheistic religion. Amornator is very similar to Lathander as a head honcho deity of light and everything, but instead of being the god of stupid good, he is instead a god of lawful stupid. His worshippers appreciate him as the king of timekeepers, order, contractual obligations and keeping shit from falling apart. So can find adherence practically anywhere, just like Lathander. The difference is that followers of Amornator can afford to be a bit more cynical about all that pansy ass good stuff, and just expect to be treated fairly. Morning Lord. Lathander's unique prestige class is a quintessential cleric boost. There is literally no downside to being a morning lord so long as you qualify. It continues the divine spellcasting progression as normal and stacks for undead turning purposes, which are the two main things clerics do anyway. So on top of that you can now double the area of light spells, gain bonuses on craft and perform checks, cast daylight and searing ray as a spell like abilities. You also gain greater and maximized turning abilities and eventually gain the ability to heal yourself of practically anything once per 10 day, and finally start generating your own light source, which also adds to your saves and armor class against undead. Like we said, so long as you worship Lathander, this prestige class makes normal levels in Cleric absolutely redundant. Sun Master Instead of Morning Lords, Clerics of Amornator become Sun Masters, who absolutely have to take the domains of law and sun in order to qualify. Sun masters are a different type of animal to morning lords, focused more on getting stuck into their enemies rather than healing or undead turning. While they do continue gaining full spellcasting progression, they don't continue improving their undead turning at all. Instead they transfer their law and sun spells to their normal spellcasting list, while also gaining access to the planning domain as a third domain, this actually improves their damage potential with the number of fire based spells that sun gives them access to. They also learn to cast searing light as a spell like ability and gain an increasing resistance to fire. The ultimate ability of the sun master is to turn themselves into a roiling ball of gaseous plasma for up to 10 rounds per day, acting like gaseous form but making them radiate light and damaging fire to anything they come into contact with. Miliki. Miliki is the goddess of good woodland creatures, fae, druids and rangers in the Forgotten Realms campaign setting. Based on the Finnish goddess of forests and the hunt who goes by the same name. History. She is often considered the daughter of Sylvanus although the two don't always see eye to eye on how to manage nature. She is heavily associated with unicorns, 
Her symbol is a unicorn. She spends her time in the grove of unicorns and her closest friend is a demigod unicorn. If you think this sounds familiar then you're not wrong. You'll be taking the piss if you can't see that Miliki and Alona are the same deity. Their portfolios and cosmology are virtually identical, with only plot points separating them and the number of siblings servants she has, mostly because a Forgotten Realms setting squeezes in as many gods as possible, so there comes a slight dilution in portfolio. As her father Sylvanus is regarded as an interloper deity, so too could Miliki and her sibling Eldeth, though some cultists in the realms believe her mother was Hanalee Selenol making her a half-elven deity. Indeed Miliki is often depicted as either a human or an elf at different times. Whether this is true or not, she doesn't have much involvement in the affairs of the realms beyond tending to her portfolio. Worshippers. Miliki is immensely popular compared to her core counterpart Alana for one very big reason, Drizzt Dorden. Because of the popularity of that single sexy elf, every fanboy and their dog worship Miliki in imitation. From a rules perspective, Miliki doesn't actually have any of her own prestige class options because the Forgotten Realms tends to focus on more active deities. However, unofficially, any prestige class that followers of Alona can qualify for should be made available to followers of Miliki since they are practically the same thing. Servants Exarchs. Miliki has a plethora of demigod servants at her disposal. Which means that although her divine portfolio on its own isn't quite as encompassing as her counterpart Ilhonas is, when you put them all together and combine it with her sister Eldeth, you end up with a powerful little pantheon of nature gods which you could consider Sylvanus to be the overgod for. Luru. The aforementioned faithful steed of Miliki is a demigoddess unicorn called Luru. Her core counterpart is Valyrian. One big deviation is that Luru is female and can take an uber hot humanoid form, complete with horn in the middle of her forehead, when not being ridden around by Miliki. Therefore fulfilling rule 63 and rule 34 at the same time. She is the daughter of Selan, which makes her the half-sister of Chauntier and most of the other major deities at the top of the pantheon. Her father is believed to be each thin, a half-unicorn. Half Pegasus Archfi, though when confronted directly about this Luru it gets confused and lays no claim to any relation, though quite possibly this is because each Thien is not native to Toral and resides elsewhere. In her own right, she is revered as the queen of intelligent animals and forms a duo with Nabanian over the rulership of such creatures, though the two aren't married, just close allies, though back in 2e she was considering building her own realm in the Beastlands to be closer to him. Interestingly, clerics of Luru all have their eyes turn deep blue or purple upon their initiation. Also, the city of Silver Moon was named for her, after she and Miliki rode into the original village and fell in love with an in there, blessing the town which would later grow into a major city of the northern realms. Yothagara. Definitely the most obscure of Miliki's servitors, Yothagara is a prime-bound demigoddess who dwells on the elfin island of Evermate. Queen of the Pegasus flocks and unicorn herds that dwell on Evermate, she appears as a magnificent female Pegasus with silver mane and rainbow colored wings. She is generally believed to be a daughter of each Thien and the younger sister of the more well known and powerful Luru, but many non elves who are aware of her suspect that she is little more than an aspect of Luru which the unicorn goddess wears to attract elven worshippers. Publishing wise, Yathagara appears only in the Ad and D splat book Elves of Evermate, which presents her as an independent demigoddess, and powers and pantheons, where she is suggested to be an aspect of Luru. The article Forgotten Deities, Luru, Nabanian in Polyhedon number 115 suggests that she is Luru's younger sister, Gwaren Windstrom. This guy started out as a mortal who was really good at tracking and was so good that he even managed to track down and slay several manifestations of the beast god, Mela. So Miliki raised him up to a demigod. His problem is that his portfolio is so freaking specific and not that much different from Miliki's at all. He has no organized clergy away from the church of Miliki, they even share the same holy places and observances. So people who meet a cleric or druid of Gwaren Winstrom might not have actually realized that he was actually a god at all and merely some proxy or a herald. This means that he is in real danger of becoming forgotten about and just being absorbed into Miliki. This probably isn't a terrible fate for him, 
since at least he would be joining his own goddess rather than being reduced to nothingness by some enemy. Shialia. Shialia is the daughter of Tappan, the patron deity of the cord species. Imagine a really hairy gnome, and either Miliki herself, or the dwarven goddess Sherendla, or the Bashtaltath gets tree spirit. So she has a rare case of her paternity not bring in question, but several potential mothers all going it's not mine. In any case, Shalia appears as a beautiful cord whose mission is to promote the doctrine of go forth and multiply as holy writ. She is a patron goddess of children, making it her business to ensure that young ones are kept safe whenever they enter woodland areas. Her followers plant things wherever they go, but unlike the church of Chauntier the act of growing is good enough, not necessarily promoting agriculture or long term planning. So expect random assortments of flowers to pop up in their wakes. Realm. Miliki and her godlings reside in the house of nature which is almost certainly a subrealm of the beastlands. The realm is inherently good, and utterly given over to nature. Petitioners who come here start out appearing much as they did in life, but over time their form slowly takes on animal traits, eventually culminating with them becoming true celestial animals and losing their minds where they becoming one with the plane. Miliki's realm is the grove of unicorns, though it has no major features other than there are a lot of unicorns here. Milil. Not to be confused with the deity Malil. Milil is the deity of words, be it through song, poetry, or prose. This makes him largely indistinct from his patron Omer as a god of knowledge except for the fact that Milil strives to spread it around the realms. His followers make particular effort to keep records of new compositions that they have never heard before and share them with others, often acting as traveling tutors. His clerics, called Solin, sponsor adventuring groups so that new sagas can be created regarding their exploits and to also make sure that bards aren't unemployed. Millil is also highly regarded amongst the Seldarine due to the beauty of his singing voice, and counts practically the entirety of them as his allies to the degree that he is often depicted as an elf. Within Millil's church there is a minor schism between his regular clerics, who tend to be quite conservative and organized and the tuna servants who are often elven, are more independent, and travel a lot. It is said that to tell the two kinds of priest apart one should compare their music, regular priests prefer traditional songs and hymns while tuna servants prefer newer compositions which might often not be to the listener's tastes. Miller also sponsors an order of paladins called the Harmonious Order who roam around the realms, often accompanied by tuna servants, seeking out romantic and glorious quests. Mistra. Mistra is the goddess of magic in the Forgotten Realms. Probably the most powerful of the pantheon, when you don't include Ao in the list. Mistra is probably the most well covered of the FR deities, because she undergoes an extensive rewrite with every edition in order to explain in universe how and why the rules get changed. History Mistral, 2nd edition Arcane Age. Born from the conflicts between Selaun and Shah, the original Mistral was a chaotic neutral entity that was relatively flighty and carefree, a real rainbow chick. She either created the weave, embodied it, or was a side effect of its creation, but in any case she was in charge of it. Her attitude towards the use of the weave was do as you please, but just don't piss me off, which meant that magic wielders could perform spectacular feats that were unheard of in later times. However, this also opened the weave up to abuse, where one particular spellcaster called Cassus decided to create a 12th level spell that would give himself control over the weave itself. The spell worked. For all of 5 minutes. While he wrestled control over the weave from the goddess, he couldn't actually control it and caused magic all over the world to get screwed up. Destroying his own empire of floating cities and essentially reverting everything back to the stone ages. Mistral figured she'd rather die than let some idiot ruin the fundamental forces of magic, so she sacrificed herself to restabilize the weave and gave birth to her successor Mistra. Mistra. First edition. The next goddess was an entirely different creature. Immediately imposing rules and restrictions on the weave, preventing those kinds of abuses from ever happening again, capping spellcasting ability to a maximum of 9th level spells, while changing how magic works. Furthermore, upon realizing that you can do pretty much anything using the power of magic and that Mistra is the god of all magic in an uncharacteristically active move, 
The Ovidia Tao manipulated events to ensure that Mistra was forced to spread her power around so that she did not become all powerful and either upset the balance or try something stupid like usurp Ao himself. So the second Mistra was made to be more active and had to spread her power around. She fell in love with a human wizard called Azath and sponsored him as the first magister giving him a humongous power boost and helping him on his journeys through the realms, to the point where he became a god himself, then continuing the tradition of magisters by starting a chain of them. Then she started appointing chosen amongst mortal followers, granting them a portion of her divine strength. Though the gifts not as powerful as the magister outright, there were a lot more of them. But unfortunately she realized that sometimes, all this power just burned through mortals if they weren't already strong enough to wield it, or some of them became corrupted by the power and became tyrants. To counter this power corrupts problem, she decided to have children and spawned a set of daughters who were imbued with the abilities of her chosen from birth and raised to appreciate their gifts. All told, Mistra had about half of her divine power wrapped up between her chosen, her magister and her servant Azath. Yet even with much of her power spread across the cosmos, she was still the most powerful deity in the pantheon, so when the tablets of fate were stolen from Ao and he kicked all the gods except Helm out into the mortal realm until somebody owned up to it, Mistra figured she could just barge her way back in. Unfortunately, powerful mortal avatar of a god that she was, in this instance she was still a mortal avatar, while Helm was a god at the height of his power. He merely bitch slapped her into oblivion in front of an entire city's worth of audience, gaining himself a reputation for lawful stupid. You really have to feel sorry for her. She started her career as a young girl who suddenly became all powerful during the most traumatic event of Pharaoh's history, then she had to defend her portfolio for a few millennia from literally everyone who wanted it, then she was punished for a crime she didn't commit, and then she was captured and tortured by one of the dickhead gods. No wonder she got a bit frustrated. Midnight Mistra, 2nd 3rd edition. The third incarnation began life as a mortal woman called Midnight who was also a traveling companion of mortal versions of Kalemva and Cyric as well as Cleric of Soon called Aiden. Midnight was pivotal in the recovery of the tablets and was rewarded with Mistra's portfolio, creating a new goddess of magic but taking the old name. This third Mistra, under the tutelage of Azath took a while to learn the ropes of her new role. She tried to maintain her original human outlook while doing the job and started shifting the church of Mistra from neutrality over to good while attempting to influence how magic was being used in the realms. Unfortunately while this sounds noble it wasn't actually the best of ideas. She, along with her former mortal turned god companions Kalemva and Cyric were placed on trial by the other gods as being negligent in their duties as deities by incompetence through humanity. Cyric managed to argue that his lore and behavior was fitting for the chaotic god of lies and betrayal, even if it was pissing off everyone else in the pantheon by risking drawing Ao's attention again, Mistra and Kalemva realized they were bungling their new jobs and agreed to sort their shit out. In the end, all three started playing by the divine rulebook, I. E. If it's not in your portfolio then you can't do it, final fucking period. Mistra, 4th edition. She was killed when Shah and Sirik teamed up. The whole spell plague was caused because there was no god of magic keeping the weave in check. Only the minor god of note keeping, Dena managed to keep the universe from turning itself inside out by writing himself into the weave and causing all the mechanical changes to magic rules in 4th edition. Mistra, 5th edition. The return of Mistra in 5e was actually done quite elegantly, playing on plot hooks laid several editions earlier. Even though Mistra as a deity was dead she lived on as a vestige. Despite this, remember that half her power was invested elsewhere in the cosmos. Her most powerful chosen, a woman called the Symbol, gathered up a whole bunch of magical energy and combined it with that evil minster who in turn used it to resurrect the goddess, creating a new amalgam of 1st edition Mistra and 2nd 3rd edition Midnight all in one package. Worshippers and Servants Spellfire Wielders Once in every generation a Slayer Spellfire Wielder is born. Or at least they thought there was. Turns out there are a lot more Spellfire Wielders than anyone knew about. Probably because the people who have it, generally don't want it, while those that don't have it, usually want it. 
Unfortunately, you can only ever obtain spell fire at birth, but that hasn't stopped unscrupulous arcanists from attempting to gain it anyway. Spellfire is raw magic that can be shaped and applied in various ways, but not quite as useful or all powerful as spells. The bearer of Spellfire acts like a living rod of absorption, being able to nullify incoming magical spells and store the energy inside them, then they can either fling it back out as raw destructive power, or to heal others with a touch. So at its most basic, Spellfire is a powerful tool for anyone, regardless of your class since it doesn't require you to actually learn how to use it. It also explains how so few people actually know they have it, since the common person in the Forgotten Realms doesn't usually come into contact with magic. Spellfire can be mastered though, with the proper training a person can become a Spellfire Channeler, who can increase their capacity to store raw magic inside them, building up a visible glow as they accumulate even more power but becoming risky to be around as the spellfire has a risk of spontaneous overload. However, they can use their power in different ways, such as the ability to blast more often, heal more effectively, drain magical items of power, knock incoming projectiles out the air, melt weapons that strike them, fly, and even go nuclear with their discharge rather than fling it precisely. It should be noted that the spell thief class is very similar to spellfire, and ought to be a viable alternative to those who want to be like spellfire wielders, but weren't born that way. Comparatively, spell thieves can recast the spell that was used on them, while spellfire is converted into raw energy which can only be used in simple ways, and a spell thief can take levels in the class at any point in far career rather than excluded from it by birth. However, spell thieves still suck though. Spellfire wielding is a feat that can be taken regardless of class, but still only a character creation. Spellfire also has a 100% success rate of absorbing magic, rather than a mere chance like the thief. Stored Spellfire has no use by duration, and like stored Spellthief magic which must be used quite quickly or it is lost, and Spellfire uses a supernatural ability, rather than a spell or spell-like ability so it cannot be interrupted or resisted. There is no class that couldn't be made better with Spellfire, except the Spell Thief because it make their abilities redundant. Chosen of Mistra. As part of Mistra's need to spread her power around, she spawned quite a few of Chosen, rather than having one like any normal god. Their ranks include Elminster, Kelvin Blackstaff Aronson, voiced by Patrick Stewart, as well as a set of seven sisters directly descended from Mistra. While they are all powerful in their own right, there is no strict need for them to be arcanists, though most of them have some ability. Nor are they given as much power or responsibility as the Magister, see below, even though the most powerful chosen, the symbol is easily the most powerful spillcaster in the realms in her own right, regardless of any external granted power. So the purpose of the chosen is to simply to hang on to Mistra's power for safekeeping. Each one of them is immune to aging disease, poison, disintegration and sleep. They gain an immunity to one spell of each level as well as gaining one spell of each level on their spells list, good if they are sorcerers, less so for wizards who can just learn spells anyway. They also gain the use of silver fire which is a lesser form of spell fire described above. It has a range of minor uses, like generating light and warmth but can only be used in the more powerful way similar to true spellfire just once an hour or so as it had to recharge. It cannot drain incoming magic, nor can it reach the supreme heights of charge spellfire, but at least they don't have to rely on draining magic to use it. The Magister. Mistra's foremost servant in the realms is the Magister and comes with the responsibility for promoting the understanding and availability of magic to the people. Unlike the Chosen of Mistra who need not necessarily be spillcasters at all, the Magister is always an arcane spillcaster, and typically always a wizard as well, because other arcanists like sorcerers or unusual classes like warmages or dread necromancers are too limited to be able to fulfill the job requirements. It used to be that the position of Magister was transferable by defeating the holder in a mage duel, which would be an impressive feat considering the sheer number of buffs the Magister gets by default. But then it ended up that the Magister would just be hounded by a queue of ambitious dickhead wizards looking for more power with no guarantee they would actually be any good in the job, thus the Magister would become a recluse and hide rather than doing the job themselves. 
Azath put a stop to transfer by mage duels and instead sponsors candidates he thinks is worthy. Though that doesn't stop the dickheads who never got the memo from lining up, hoping to have a go anyway. When appointed, the personal sigil of the Magister appears in every temple of Mistra for 10 minutes and every magic user in the world feels a ripple, informing them the position has changed. Mistra has also decreed that a priest must reveal the identity of the Magister if they know it, subject to a suitable donation to the church of course. Thankfully, the new Magister gets a 10 day grace period, where they get teleported to a pocket dimension so they can get instructed by heralds of Azath in the requirements of the role, while usually getting access to the spellbook of every previous holder of the role, a significant prize in itself. When they get released back into the general population, because it is their duty to spread magic around, they are able to recover half of the experience cost for items they create if they give them away, turning them into the arcane Santa Claus. Other abilities include, a complete immunity to enchantment, and a plus 2 holy resistance to all magical effects. Spell Resistance 20 The ability to sense wild or dead magic zones. They can hear whenever their name gets mentioned anywhere in the world along with the following 9 words and the general direction of the speaker. Constant min blank protection. The ability to cast levitate, true seeing, read magic and feather fall at will and cast Dimension Door and Water Walk 6 slash Day. They can pass through any magical barrier of 6th level or lower without ill effect. Complete immunity to a chosen spell of each spell level, like the chosen. The ability to imbue permanency on any spell they know. They get spell focus for every spell. They prepare their spells in 10 minutes. So no wonder everyone wants the job. Holders of the role can step down from the role voluntarily and allow someone to take it from them, presumably subject to Mistress and Azath's approval. But considering it usually takes some substantial magical power to get the role in the first place, the gods would like you to keep serving. In which case the previous holder can relegate themselves to being a chosen of Azath, or become a sentient magical item, or start over by being reincarnated as a whole new person with magical gifts. Militant Orders Mistra has a few militant orders of non-arcanists dedicated to her service, the Order of the Shooting Star, Rangers, and the Knights of Mystic Fire, Paladins. The Shooting Star Rangers lose the ability to gain an animal companion, the bonus endurance feat and the trackless step ability, but in trade they get one bonus spell slot of each spell level, as well as a plus two caster level bonus when using ranger spells and also get a slightly expanded spell list. Mystic Fire Paladins lose the ability to turn undead and cannot remove disease. But they augment their smite ability to stagger victims and make it difficult to cast spells unless they pass a concentration check. They also get bonus spell slots for each spell level and the ability to dispel magic as part of a melee attack once per day. Both orders can take a feat that allows them to take wizard sorcerer spells in their ranger paladin spell list without any other restriction than having to use a spellbook to keep them in, which can radically improve how useful these classes function in a normal game. Dweoma Keepers. Mistress specialist priests are the Dweoma Keepers. As expected for a deity of magic they are familiar with both arcane and divine spellcasting, but are not equally good at both in the same way that a mystic theurge would be. Entry requirements include being able to cast level 2 arcane and divine spells and access to the magic, or spell, domain, so druids need not apply. They get a casting increase every level, but have to choose which class to use. Meaning unless you have a precocious apprentice feat from complete arcane you are essentially giving up 3 levels of your primary spell casting class to use this prestige class. The benefits for doing so allow them to choose a spell at every other level and be able to spontaneously convert prepared spells whether arcane or divine into those chosen spells. Which can be very useful if you choose combat spells, meaning you can prepare your slots for utility encounters without being defenseless. Other class features are interchangeable, in Faiths and Pantheons. FR 3.0, they gain bonus feats similar to a wizard, but in complete divine. Core 3.5, they gain the ability to cast some prepared spells as supernatural abilities, rendering them impossible to counter or interrupt. 
your GM should decide which version of the class is most appropriate to your campaign, but the FR version is more difficult to qualify for, needing more feats and for your race to be human. Realm. Mistra's domain of Dwiamahatis was a magical mountain located in Aronia the second layer of Elysium. Dwiamahat is located at the summit where all spells cast are automatically enlarged, extended and empowered without any modification to the spell level or casting time. Her servants Azath, Savros and Velcharun all occupy various caverns and chambers within the mountain. Like most petitioners of Elysium, those who end up here in the afterlife get to keep some memories of their former life. In fact, petitioners of the gods of magic also gain spell resistance and damage reduction, making this realm a veritable fortress of spell casters. Unfortunately with the 4th edition spell plague, the realm exploded upon the death of Mistras, taking the other resident gods with it. It's back now in 5e. It's fine. Shialia. Shialia is the daughter of Tappan, the patron deity of the chord species, imagine a really hairy gnome and either Miliki herself, or the dwarven goddess Sherendla, or the Gestalt Uthgit's tree spirit. So she has a rare case of her paternity not bring in question, but several potential mothers all going it's not mine. In any case, Shalia appears as a beautiful cord whose mission is to promote the doctrine of go forth and multiply as holy writ. She is a patron goddess of children, making it her business to ensure that young ones are kept safe whenever they enter woodland areas. Her followers plant things wherever they go, but unlike the Church of Chauntier the act of growing is good enough, not necessarily promoting agriculture or long-term planning. So expect random assortments of flowers to pop up in their wakes. Rural is a great app available on the Apple and Google Play Store as well as desktop for creating beautiful 8-bit character art. The app has 14 supported races, 150 plus weapons. 400 plus armor pieces for you to mix and match, 20 plus mini bases. There is that much to work from I was able to make Cold Steel the Hedgehog, the God Emperor of Mankind, Pepe and they are always adding more artwork. The app also has a character sheet to help keep track of everything during games. And if that wasn't enough you can play about with the app for free with limited artwork. So go ahead check it out and if you decide to buy the app use promo code NickBedia for 10% off and it lets them know we sent you. It's a great sponsor and a great app and we hope you guys go ahead and check it. But let's get back to the video. Good Chaotic. Lyra. Lyra is the Forgotten Realms goddess of joy, happiness, contentment, dance, festivals, and freedom. Not to be confused with Lyra. History. Lyra, much like Lathander, hasn't really had any major importance to the realms. The only time was during the Time of Troubles, when she joined up with Joaquin and took her portfolio to allow her to travel the plains. She continued giving Joaquin's followers spells after her disappearance, and following her return, gave her portfolio back. Worshippers. The Joybringers, as Lyra's clerics are known as, are easily recognized by their colorful and festive outfits. They seek to bring happiness to others, even if only momentarily, and prevent misery from spreading. Dogma. Each day is another movement in the Elysian Rigadoon, the joyful dance of a life lived in rapture and without care or frustration. Seek joy always by working to bestow it upon others. Festivals are for all, gather into celebrations the lost, the lonely, the exiled and outlawed, the shunned, and even your foes. Let folk follow their own desires, and never fail to follow your own. Loru. The aforementioned faithful steed of Miliki is a demigoddess unicorn called Loru. Her core counterpart is Valyrian. One big deviation is that Loru is female, and can take a new heart humanoid form, complete with horn in the middle of her forehead, when not being ridden around by Miliki. Therefore fulfilling rule 63 and rule 34 at the same time. She is the daughter of Selan, which makes her the half-sister of Chauntier and most of the other major deities at the top of the pantheon. Her father is believed to be Ichthyan, a half-unicorn, half-Pegasus Archfi, though when confronted directly about this Luru gets confused and lays no claim to any relation, though quite possibly this is because Ichthyan is not native to Toral and resides elsewhere. 
In her own right, she is revered as the queen of intelligent animals and forms a duo with Nabanian over the rulership of such creatures, though the two aren't married, just close allies, though back in 2e she was considering building her own realm in the Beastlands to be closer to him. Interestingly, clerics of Luru all have their eyes turned deep blue or purple upon their initiation. Also, the city of Silver Moon was named for her, after she and Miliki rode into the original village and fell in love with an in there, blessing the town which would later grow into a major city of the northern realms. Selaun. Selaun, the moon maiden, is the forgotten realm's god of light, stars, the moon, navigation and good aligned lycanthropes. History. Selaun, alongside her twin Shah, was created by Ao in the beginning. The two work together creating the realm space of Forgotten Realms, eventually creating Jauntia, who was the deified embodiment of a Bitoral. Of course, the fact that they literally have a daughter makes them not girlfriends, but sisters. Because 80s. From then on, the sisters decided on how things should go on from there. What started as petty arguments about whether the cosmic curtains matched the daycare, whether shoes needed to be removed upon entering the universe, and whether pets were kept outside. It eventually escalated into full out war between the goddesses, and at this point all of their decisions had been creating other deities to fill in the gaps of their creation. For instance, Chauntia thought the universe was a little chilly, so Selan turned the space heater on, presumably awakening a Mornator. So having created other deities by the end of their fight like Targus, the original god of war, Bonda, the god of decay, Jurgle, god of strife, death and the dead, they had pretty much escalated their little cat fight up to a full blown military conflict. It eventually came to a turning point when Selan had had enough of her sister's shit, and tore a piece of herself off and flung it at Shah. The pure divine essence literally ripped Shah a new one. And when it passed out the other side it formed another deity, Mistral, goddess of magic, and pretty much the most powerful of their creation so far. Unfortunately the attack had left Selan significantly weakened, and she took some negative levels, becoming an intermediate deity. But thankfully Mistral and most of the other significant gods of the universe decided to side with her, pushing the conflict into a stalemate. Worshippers. Selan's church has two main goals, fight against evil lycanthropes and summon shards, blue-haired, female planeters, to fight against Shah and her minions. Realm. Selan operates her very own planar domain called the Gates of the Moon which a realm of floating rock and ocean under a perpetual night sky, which one can assume would be analogous to Esgid and the Great Wheel cosmology, though as the realm of a deity. The Gates of the Moon is bound by its own unique set of rules in addition to the expected planar trays, where recruiters have full control over their abilities while in the Divine Realm. Any arcane spell cast needs a particular school trigger, which you need to learn from the locals, who happen to be angelic beings like planeters, lilans and celestial werewolves, so you can't come here to cause mayhem. Divine spellcasters lose their abilities dependent on the relative distance between their own deity and Asgard. Any summoning spell always summons Enherger. Recent events in the conversion to 4e Forgotten Realms, since there were so many gods that some had overlapping portfolios, many were removed and some were mashed together, with little regard for their story, and therefore how much sense it made in universe to combine them. As there were multiple goddesses of the moon, Elastri was killed off and Selan was combined with Sehanin, who was the elven version. This completely ignored the fact that there was little overlap among the three goddesses, Sehanin is also, and mainly, the elven deity of death and mysteries, while for Elastri, her association with the moon is mostly cosmetic and due to the fact that surface drow are more comfortable by night, she is not a moon goddess and her goals activities are completely unrelated to that. In any case, in core 4th edition, Sehanin took the mantle of moon goddess, in 4th edition Forgotten Realms it transpired that Sehanin had been an aspect of Selan all along, or vice versa, even though that made absolutely zero sense, since Sehanin has always been an interloper, multispheric deity, while Selun is one of the deities involved in the creation myth of Toril, therefore predating the arrival of Sehanin. In any case, while there were two different religions for goddesses of the moon and they were allowed to have differing origin stories and power levels, 
In 4e they were in essence the same thing. Needless to say the simplification of the Pantheon would quickly be reversed when wizards went back on their choices for 4e. In 5e, the retcon that had Sehanin become an aspect of Selun was re-retconned, and Elastri was restored, or revealed to have survived by it Greenwood, despite having lost her divinity for a century or so, and then recovering it with a second sundering. This gets more complicated when you consider that Sehanin is also an aspect for yet another goddess called Angharad. It's at this point the Athar would stop by to hand you their recruitment flyer. Sharis. Sharis, originally called Bast, is the Mulharandi goddess of beauty, pleasure and cats. Her portfolio had enough unique appeal that she crossed over into the general Firaunian pantheon of the Forgotten Realms. Considered to be utterly self-interested and fickle, it is often forgotten that she is actually a deity of protection and battle, and is the nemesis of the snake deity set. Despite the similarities in name, she should not be confused with Bastet, the Mr. and Immortal who was worshipped as Bastet on Earth for a time and who created the Rakasta race. History Starting out as Bast, she was the lieutenant of the war deity Anher and the eternal enemy of the evil deity set. Originally, she was the slayer of vermin, snakes, scorpions, rats, and was seen as a protector against famine, as vermin tend to eat or spoil the food. At some point in Anna's war with Set, Bast assumed the portfolio of Felody who was a goddess of pleasure and cats, which was enough to cause a complete shift in her personality and lead her to quit her efforts against the god of evil and wander off on her own and join the Faraunian pantheon. Because the Mulharandi pantheon were interlopers from another plane, Ao generally preferred to keep everything neat and tidy and not have too much crossover, but he allowed the transfer because Musk had already insinuated his way into the religions of the old empires, Mulharand and Unther, because they didn't have their own god of thieves. So because Ao plays fair, he allowed Bast and Musk to expand geographically into each other's areas. So she traveled away from Mulharand in order to seek out new experiences and began a journey of serial sexual conquests and experimenting with various drugs that left small cults all over the place. In her travels, she assumed the portfolio of yet another deity, called Zandila the Dancer who was an elven deity localized in the Uwood, whose portfolio encompassed physical passion. Zandila had attempted to seduce Varon, the son of Loth and was betrayed and her avatar was captured and drained of power. However Bast arrived just in time to prevent the drow deity from assuming her portfolio, and a diminished Zandila freely merged with Bast and combined the two religions. From then on, one of Bast's titles was the Dancing Lady, though she still occasionally acts in the name of Zandila for the elves. The name Sherius only came later, when Bast fell totally under the sway of Shah, goddess of darkness, and ironically a feminine analog to Set, where Bast continued her experimental phase by experiencing lesbianism with a much older woman. Shah taught Bast to seek out pleasures without limit or restriction, turning her into a dark and dangerous deity in her own right, and about as far from her original incarnation as a goddess of protection and good as she could get. Unbeknownst to Bast, this dark goth phase that Shah was encouraging was just Shah fattening Sherris up so that she could be consumed and give the goddess of darkness more power. It was only during the time of troubles that Sherris was saved by Soon, the actual goddess of beauty and pleasure, who was inevitably sexier than Shah ever could be. So the thrill-seeking little lesbian cat switched sides again and became a force for good. Sherris moved her belongings into a ghetto in Soon's home of Brightwater and started getting out of her drug and sex adult stupor. She made peace with her estranged companion and her and has only started putting her life back together. It's a bit difficult for her though, seeing as her fierce independent streak causes her to ignore most advice, combined with her inherent pursuit of pleasure continually leads her into dark places which sometimes brings her very close to overlap with Loviata the maiden of pain and puts her at risk of getting drawn into yet another portfolio struggle. Worshippers. Celebrant of Sheris. The Celebrant of Sheris is the goddess's foremost prestige class. However it is neither a reckless nymphomaniac, nor is it an evangelical cleric. Instead it is a warrior arcanist that crosses a little bit of enchanter with a little bit of barbarian. It relies on rules from the book of exalted deeds and you need two exalted feats to qualify, meaning your character has to maintain a good outlook, 
and specifically a chaotic good alignment. Aside from this the class needs 7 points in diplomacy and perform skills to qualify, that's it. So pretty much anyone who worships Sheris can qualify. From there, you get charisma based arcane spellcasting from a limited spell list up to level 4 spells, along with a cat familiar. The class also comes with some spell like and supernatural abilities that allow you pull off an effect similar to bardic music where you can fascinate, compel or even force people to fall in love with each other on failed saves. The barbarian comparison comes from the fact that in addition to all the magical stuff listed above, they can enter a rage a number of times per day, using exactly the same mechanic. They can also perform full attacks as part of a charge action and may also haste themselves as an extraordinary ability. The only downsides include a shitty barb progression that doesn't result capitalize on the benefits of having combat abilities, and the only good save is will. So it appears the class doesn't know what it wants to be. However, it could be a powerful extra class for the group's warrior who want to pick up a few arcane tricks while also augmenting their own fighting prowess with actions they couldn't otherwise do. But because it doesn't improve existing spellcasting of any type, it is practically useless for clerics or wizards. Glorious Servitor of Bast. Sharis's other prestige class from Lost Empires of Feran turns your character into a pseudo lycanthrope as befits a member of a beast cult. It requires improved turning and second level divine casting to qualify for this class, but it has nothing to do with those features, so it's a bit of an oddball class that takes your cleric career into a dead end. Instead, the glorious servitor prestige class lets you turn into a leopard at level 1, then gives you increasing buffs as you progress, such as plus 6 AC and plus 3 STR while in animal form, and also giving spell resistance poison immunity and eventual transformation into an outsider. Despite the bizarre entry requirements, this class at least has an attempt to theme, but competes against a druid for the shapa shifting party role. But is stuck with one form and no spell progression. Dancers of Sheris. Introduced in Dragon Magazine, this prestige class combines divine spell casting with aspects from the wizard, monk and ranger archetypes. Creating something rather awesome. You are required to be able to cast 3rd level divine spells as a condition for entry, but thankfully the class continues with full spell casting progression. It also grants you a cat familiar that will make you the bane of 1st level commoners everywhere. Also, rather uniquely your familiar increases in ability based on your character level rather than class level, this is a good thing, so you can get a solid companion even if you don't progress with this class fully. What's more, is that from level 3 onwards, gain the class feature to polymorph your familiar into a much larger animal. Giving you your own mighty battle kit. Other cool features include passive plus 2 bonuses to dexterity and charisma based skill checks, plus 4 bonus to diplomacy and plus 2 DC bonuses on enchantment spells and to your resistance against enchantment. We mentioned ranger earlier, well you get favored enemies, but rather than races. You target members of a specific organization chosen from the churches of Set, Shar or Veron, giving you yet more passive bonuses to skills and damage against them. Also, you can literally make an opponent cream his pants on a melee touch attack, essentially stunning them for 1 round, or 1d4 plus 1 rounds at 10th level, so long as they have a nervous system that works, so no jerking off creatures that are undead or goo girls. The final ability of the class allows you to substitute verbal components of enchantment spells for performance checks, specifically dancing. Meaning that you practically have the silent spell ability for enchantments without needing to prepare ahead of time or increase your slot level. All in all this is probably the best prestige class for priests of Bast, giving some really unique features that theme quite well with the deity of both pleasure and war. Realm. Sharis's personal domain is called Rapture which is a quiet little neighborhood located in the planar city of Brightwater on the plain of Arborea. Rapture is considered the rough part of Brightwater where any of your darkest, most illicit desires can be met if you look hard enough, essentially making this place the fabled drug den and sex party that Arborea ought to be famous for, considering its reputation as a plane of self-fulfillment and indulgence. Apparently if you have to ask for it in hushed tones because it might cause a scandal in polite society, the odds are it exists in rapture. 
Do bear in mind the plane is still chaotic good in alignment, so no matter how lost you get in the miasmic haze of opiates and orgies, unless you came into the plane with evil intentions, you're likely to be safe. That also means that despite advertising that they can get anything you want, you're not going to find torture porn or underage traps here, so get lost you sick fuckers. Though with the omnipresence of shapeshifters and level of D in the realms, you might find some adult creature that looks the part. Soon, pronounced Sune, is the Forgotten Realms version of Aphrodite, known for her vanity and casual flirtatiousness. She is both simultaneously extremely shallow while also being surprisingly deep. Summary. Nobody really knows where she came from, other than she is one of those fundamental deities of a particular force rather than a particular people or set of ethics. So it explains why she could be as powerful as a greater deity without being notably militaristic or widespread. Soon is renowned for being extremely superficial and flighty with her affections, like some Hollywood socialite. She has been romantically involved with practically every other non-destructive deity in every pantheon. While she is the goddess of love, it is really only the outward appearance of love. Meaning that she gives particular favor to handsome beautiful worshippers while rejecting the ugly ones. Priests and priestesses of her faith are rated by looks and scars or other unsightly marks are grounds for religious stigma. Amongst the other gods, Despite her status as a greater deity, she is rarely considered worth the time. Like Paris Hilton or Kim Kardashian, soon is considered a bit of a joke. Amongst other deities of beauty and love, particularly those from other prime material worlds, soon is considered to be some backwater harlot with delusions of grandeur. Despite her apparent power and influence, she has little involvement in any of the major political struggles of the gods. However, the curious thing is that despite her somewhat shallow nature, she can be freaking protective over what she considers her portfolio. Rather than shrieking helplessly like some victimized maiden she is quite willing to get into armed conflict in situations surrounding the destruction of beauty. Realm. Soon resides in the realm of bright water on the plain of Arborea, sharing it with some of the other deities of hedonism and enjoyment. The realm is practically a cosmopolitan city full of romance, excitement and intrigue. Soon's portion of it is called the Hearthfire Quarter and is actually considered relatively quiet compared to the rest, which are comparable to Las Vegas, Ibiza, Magaluf or downtown Bangkok. Soon's portions would be more like some idyllic tourist locale, full of beauty and culture. Where the inhabitants can appreciate the finer things, rather than darting from thrill to thrill. The realm was actually destroyed during the transition to Fauria as part of the Spell Plague, but soon would rebuild it after seeking refuge with Selun and the Gates of the Moon which is ordinarily located in Isgard. Worshippers. Soon is worshipped by anyone who wants to be beautiful, or who likes beautiful things. Heartwooders. The head honchos of Soon's religion are the Heartwooders. They make it their business to be sexy 100% of the time and it is their own personal mission to nurture love and intimacy in other people. As a prestige class, it's quite awesome. Though it is hindered by some quite limiting entry requirements, you need to be chaotic good, you need to have access to third level spells, you need four feats, three of which have nothing to do with spellcasting, and of course you need to worship soon. What this gets you is a full spell casting progression along with 3 stroke 4 barb and good fortune will saves. You also get a class feature at every level, granting you bonuses on charisma checks, spell penetration with enchantment spells, the ability to buff people with a kiss, cry holy water, eventually become fey, and every other level you increase your charisma by 1, totaling plus 5. So if you started out as a sorcerer, this class is absolutely fantastic, and because of the prerequisites just to enter it you can't really be accused of power gaming. Order of the Ruby Rose. Soon is rather unusual for a chaotic deity in that she sponsors lawful paladins. Meaning that somebody somewhere is a bit hypocritical when your deity tells you to live and love freely, but you use your powers to enforce law and order. Ruby Rose Knights are a set of substitution levels for paladin which is essentially the same as a Pathfinder archetype. What this gets you is early access to the new Love Bite spell, allowing you to kiss someone from a distance. Or bite them for one point of damage. 
It makes you immune to charisma damage drain and also allows you to give a hearty pat on the back to one of your companions for a plus 4 morale bonus on attacks, saves and skills for a minute. The trade off is that your paladin become less capable of dealing with diseases. Which as a worshipper of free love, you'd think would come in handy. Time Aura. Time Aura, also known as Lady Luck, was the goddess of luck and good fortune. She was kind and friendly in attitude, and she encouraged risk taking and was often revered by the bold and the brave. Due to this, she was a patron goddess to adventurers and gamblers, who both could use strokes of good luck regularly. She was quite popular, with many churches and temples spanning far. History. Time Aura, as well as her sister, was created when Selan split Titch, the previous god of luck, into two beings. Timora and Beshaba took on Titch's aspects of good luck and bad luck respectively. Due to her kind and friendly attitude, Timora could boast of her many allies amongst the other deities. Timora also had a few unpleasant relationships with some deities. One unpleasant relationship, for example, was with her sister, Beshaba. Beshaba and Timora have had an ongoing struggle since they were created, arising from their completely opposite aspects. Worshippers. Those who relied on luck relied on Timora. People such as adventurers and gamblers, who relied on luck to achieve their respective goals, praised Timora and her church for the luck they received. Another group of people who worshipped Timora were halflings, especially lightfoot halflings. The halflings saw Timora as a halfling god, due to the fact that she manifested herself as a halfling to them. The halflings firmly held this belief thinking that she had merely tricked the other, taller races into worshipping her. Realm. Timora inhabited the gates of the moon. She moved there after the spell plague and created and connected seven earth motes. She named this new area the Great Wheel. On the Great Wheel, gambling and games of chance ran wild. Vorka. Not much is known about Vorka's origins. Other than he was a ship captain from Mintan who supposedly challenged Umbali herself and managed to beat her, earning him elevation to becoming a demigod, with help from the Red Knight. He is depicted as a jolly sea captain, complete with blue coat and black beard, manning the helm of his great galleon Windjammer which can fly. His worship is performed on seagoing vessels, and many of his clerics, called Wavatamers, act as crewmen on ships to the point that they can receive double blessings from Selam to aid their navigation skill due to the fact that both deities are friends. Even though he has his own vessel, the Windjammer, his primary temple is actually a separate vessel called the Schooner of the Seas which may have been gifted to Vorka by Gond and is unmatched in size and speed, serving as a floating cathedral. A second floating church called the Temple of Endless Waves and Wind is built on the back of a giant sea turtle and swims around the Sea of Fallen Stars and is said to have reached its location by being carried overland on back of an army of reef giants during the time of troubles. Vorka does have temples on land which are marked by tall wooden columns and sheets of cloth reminiscent of ship masts, though he is practically unknown in inland areas. Originally he was considered somewhat unreliable as a deity of choice, since he would routinely forget to answer the prayers of his faithful, causing him to become a god to be placated rather than venerated, though since the time of troubles his attitude became far more proactive and hence his worship spread rapidly. Of this merry little pantheon of battle demigods, Vorka is the only one to have actually expanded into the core D&D pantheon getting his profile reprinted in Stormrack where he exists in pretty much exactly the same form. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.